Okay, cool. So uh, welcome um, uh, to uh, this conversation on art practice uh, and, and a few other topics related. Uh, I'm uh, grateful that you have donated uh, your time, your afternoon or your early evening um, to, to have this really, what I think can be a very generative, di generative discussion for us um, as artists and, and potential collaborators, um, but also a generative discussion for um, other artists and other organizers, right? And so I, uh, uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Jason Magabo Perez. I'm an assistant professor of ethnic studies at California State University, San Marcos. Um, I am currently uh, broadcasting from uh, the City Heights neighborhood of San Diego, Kumayai territory. Um, and uh, I, I uh, uh, brought this assemblage of, of artists and organizers together uh, to kind of see uh, what kind of models and what kind of templates might come out of our, our, our conversation around practice, right? And so I want to uh, maybe start off with a little bit of a, a preface. A preface. Uh, I, uh, often uh, what I like to do is go back to, to poetry uh, to kind of um, initiate some thinking, right? And so uh, uh, today I want to share a poem uh, by a poet by the name of Mila D. Aguilar, who was a is a uh, Filipina poet who was um, incarcerated under martial law during the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines. Um, her book, A Comrade is As Precious as a Seedling, uh, was published by uh, Kitchen Table Woman of Color Press. And so I often go back to this book um, uh, uh, because it's, it kind of signals for me a, a really important solidarity among women of color, uh, transnational uh, uh, solid, uh, feminist solidarity. Um, and Mila Aguilar's uh, book being published by Women of Color Press is, is a kind of, I think, a really important move um, in the introduction. Audrey, Audrey Lord is the one who published it. Um, Audrey Lord's introduction uh, really briefly says um, about Mila Aguilar's poetics, this is the kind of poetry I need around me. Mila Aguilar does, in truth, make the revolution irresistible, right? And I think that in a lot of ways, uh, 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 thinking... Uh, both kind of within the context of poetics and poetry, but also broadly within art practice, I think I could say the same for me about your work, right? Uh, and so I'm going to read this poem by Mila Aguilar to kind of start things off uh, called Poem Amid, Poem Written Amid Struggle, right? So this is Mila D. Aguilar, uh, Poem Written Amid Struggle. I cry for the revolution, comrade, when willy-nilly, like the Marquis de Sade, we twist principles we have learned in some far past when in total disregard of the data of the present, we hound the people into some bleak unknown future. All because we, what else but ourselves? After trying so hard to see you from where you stand, I am tempted to join the black rosary passing by which they say wards off evil, but I do not believe in God. So for now, I find refuge. I writing a poem, mustering enough strength to face opportunism of all types. So this will be an open-ended conversation uh, around uh, quite a few uh, different kinds of topics that I I've kind of been thinking through. Uh, some of the buzzwords that come to mind as I was kind of thinking of assembling this uh, was the, these various kind of notions and practices or terms that come up in this kind of work, right? Community-based art, public practice, social practice. Um, as a writer, uh, certainly I'm, I'm inspired and in, in thinking about um, uh, June Jordan's model of poetry for the people. Uh, popular education, solidarity, collective praxis, collaboration, uh, participatory art making, um, mutual aid, uh, community organizing, uh, and accountability, right? And so I, while I know that everybody's work is, is very context specific uh, with their own kind of sets of uh, funding streams or uh, different ways in which we navigate our relationship to institutions, um, I'm hoping that um, having a, uh, starting this conversation will help us kind of see and, and maybe uh, um, identify potential models that we might be able to share with each other, kind of a resource and skill sharing, right, to kind of figure out um, what 
uh, some effective uh, community-based or, or solidarity practices in art making and, and community organizing uh, um, could come out of such a conversation, right? And so um, uh, I will kind of invite uh, um, you all to kind of talk about your work uh, and then we'll have a conversation after that in, in hopes to, to kind of uh, gesture towards a future uh, uh, conver future conversations and collaborations, right? And so uh, we have Maya Makrandilao, uh, Miriam uh, Parzikar, Christina Ree, and Misael Diaz, and uh, we'll start off with Maya. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jason, for inviting me to share my work with you all. Uh, my name is Maya Markrandilal. I am a Los Angeles-based artist um, and writer. Uh, I also work um, with youth development. Um, I am broadcasting from my home in uh, Thai town uh, in Los Angeles, uh, originally the, and still the lands of the Tongva people. Um, and such a beautiful way to open Jason and um, the idea of making the revolution irresistible. Um, and so I think I, I really connect with that, especially with this work that I'm sharing today. Um, uh, this uh, project, uh, hashtag new global matriarchy. Um, it, the idea sort of started, um, I guess, uh, kind of winter 2015, um, if we can all bring our minds back to that time and <laughs> so long ago and like what was sort of at the forefront. But I think for me, I was thinking, you know, we were, we were thinking about like, well, everything that we didn't want, right? We didn't want black people to be shot in the street. You know, we didn't want um, to like live in this capitalist system. We didn't want to live in a system um, where, you know, women, uh, and women of color in particular uh, were kind of systemically oppressed. Um, but I wanted to start to think like, what is it that I'm at, like we are actually trying to imagine and, and what would represent like a complete break with what we currently exist in. Um, and so I came up with this, I, like this just hashtag that I just wrote in my journal called New Global Matriarchy. Um, and uh, when I decided to kind of turn it into something beyond like this thing that I wrote in my journal, um, I decided that I didn't want to do it by myself. And so I had come up with these idea, this idea of performing as Hindu goddesses that are incarnated in the present. And I decided to um, bring them from a 2D world into the 3D world, uh, into our, our lived world. Um, and so I decided to start with Lakshmi. Uh, she is the goddess of wealth and abundance. Often she is connected to like in the, the kind of pantheon that most people are familiar with, like Venus. So, um, but the thing is, is that as an incarnation, she would reflect the society that she is in. And so um, I was thinking along the lines of, well, what does this society see as like sexual and abundant? And so I really went towards a kind of Kim Kardashian sort of vibe. Um, and so Lakshmi was joined by the Nigerian goddess Oya, performed by one of my collaborators, Stephanie Graham. Um, and so it was just a girl's day out. You know, we went, we kicked a Picasso statue. We went to the Art Institute with a sledgehammer and walked in. Um, and then we went to, you know, where everyone goes to shop and we staged a two goddess protest. Um, and, uh, and this was sort of, we had a, a friend follow us around like he was the paparazzi and took paparazzi shots of us. And then that was what became the, um, the installation uh, that was, was shown of the work. Um, and we also created these pins, um, which we wore and then we would pass out, um, we pass them out at the show and then at, in later uh, events. And so one of the pins uh, was my pussy tastes like justice um, was the, the pin that uh, you could you could wear. Uh, the other one was revolution requires friends and uh, man knows nothing. Uh, and and I think you know that idea of like revolution requires friends like it requires um, like our human connections to each other uh, you know was kind of at the at the start of this you know that like I wasn't going to just do a singular performance by myself which is what I often did. Um, I was going to be with someone uh, in in conversation. 
Um, so then after that, we, we were invited to do a live stream for um, an artist run internet television station in Chicago called um, uh, Acre TV. And um, I should mention like this started in Chicago. I was living there. I guess I skipped over that part. I used to live in Chicago. Um, so this was, I guess, early 2016. So still winter time, but um, a couple months later. Um, and so there were a wide range of offerings because uh, basically it was a 24 seven live stream. So we were sort of trying to come up with as much content as possible to sort of fill up this live stream. Uh, so sometimes we were just playing, you know, we went put out a call for videos, we played people's videos, we did screenings of films. Um, the lower right hand corner is a poetry night that we did. Um, lower left hand corner is an exorcism for Donald Trump. So he was, he came to uh, Chicago to give a speech and I performed an exorcism as the goddess Saraswati. And luckily he was prevented from speaking that one time. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe we just need more goddesses to get together to prevent him from speaking ever again. Um, the top uh, image, uh, we created a, a video together. It's called Ritual for Decolonization. And um, we went to the Cook County Correctional Facility, which is like this huge, massive building in the middle of the Lawndale community in Chicago um, and did a, a, a ritual um, outside. And so this was done before. So this was sort of like a, a gesture to, to imagine like where are the politics of this project? Like, yes, it's communal and yes, it's all these different pieces and all these different collaborators are bringing in. Um, but that like central is also like this sort of state violence that uh, we all kind of exist right alongside of. Cause I mean, this facility, you know, it's, it's, it's just like right there. And it's, I think it's like the third largest jail system in the United States. Um, and then uh, I also did Letters to White Boys where the goddess Saraswati performed um, letters that were written by myself or by other people um, of things that they wish they could have said. Um, so that certain situations where, you know, some kind of microaggression happens and uh, you can't speak back. Um, so it was to sort of voice those, um, like the things that you kind of keep inside because you're maintaining some sort of societal norms about comfort uh, and that Saraswati is not held by those uh, requirements and so she can do whatever she wants. Um, I'm trying to move a little quickly here. Uh, I also, the goddess Lakshmi went to the Women's March in 2017 and interviewed some people and then Oya, who, so, so Lakshmi was in LA at that point and moved to LA and Oya was still in uh, Chicago. And so Lakshmi went to the Women's March in LA and Oya decided to not go to the Women's March. And so Lakshmi interviewed people at the Women's March about why they were there and um, trying to imagine what kind of a future would look like if all women were free. And then Oya did, an inter did interviews with women who didn't go to the March. Um, and so then that was shown as two videos um, at, oh, I can't remember the name of the, conference right now. Um, so uh, I was in LA and I was thinking about, you know, how do I build community uh, here? And so um, I, I took the idea of the poetry night that we did it with Acre TV and I decided to create a poetry and performance circle. Um, and so th these took place, uh, I've done two so far um, at Los Angeles Valley College Art Gallery. Um, and just inviting uh, women of women and non-binary people of color performers um, and artists to participate in this uh, kind of just a event. So you 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 arrive. Um, Diana Sofia Estrada. She does these sort of participatory printmaking. You can see behind me. These are what the prints look like when they come out, and they spell R E V and then O L T. Um, and they're uh, rolling pins. So you're rolling pin printing uh, posters that then you can take home with you. Um, uh, what, my main collaborator for this was Scarlett Kim. Um, she's the one wearing like the multi-faced mask in the lower middle picture. Um, she, uh, she's a theater director and performance artist. Um, and so she helped, like, I, I was bringing in people from my network and she was bringing in people from hers. And so it was like this meeting of, um, of different networks. Um, 
So, so yes, yeah, so this was the first uh, event, and then these are images from the second event that we did. Um, and uh, again, um, Lakshmi is there. She's sort of like the master of ceremonies for the event. So uh, I open it up with sort of a modified ritual for decolonization performance um, where I circumambulate the space and sort of create this idea of like this sort of sacred uh, space that exists outside of um, I guess the, the time and space that we are currently in. Um, sorry, I'm over, I'm over my time, but just to wrap up, these are some other images of, of some other performers, uh, in, in the project. Thanks. Thank you, Maya. Um, Marion, ready? Hi, everyone. I'm just going to take a second here and figure out how to share my screen, which I can never remember how to do. Um, wait, can somebody tell me how to do that? There's a green button uh, at the bottom. Oh. It says share screen, and then you can choose which, which one you want to do. Exactly those, the one that I'm ignoring. OK. Let me just make sure. Um, I can just talk a little bit about who I am in the meantime. Um, my name is Mariam Yvette Pariskar. I'm a, what am I? I do a lot of things. I am a scholar. Um, I'm working on my PhD in American Studies and African American Studies at Yale University. Um, I live in Jersey City, um, Lenapeo King Land. Um, I, what do I do? Um, my work really spans relational ethnic studies and thinks about aesthetics and at the same time I'm also a poet and that's how I became connected um, to this group Tierra Narrative um, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, I am just one member of the collective and our role our roles are very non-hierarchical um, so we all work um, very openly with the plans that we pursue. We, um, you know, we tend to decide um, through group meetings what we're going to put on for a given event. Um, um, I figured the best way for me to share this with you was just to walk you through the things that we have on social media because it's really been the best document of what we've been doing. Um, so get a narrative. Um, again, it's non-hierarchical. We're based in the New York metropolitan area and we call ourselves a um, Central American Production House creating spaces for transnational conversations and collaborations between the Central American diaspora and the homelands. Um, the collective has existed since 2016. I'm a fairly new member of the collective. Um, really, we really started teaming up this year. Um, but the work that the collective has done has addressed subjects such as migration, displacement, indigeneity, um, activism, and our relationship to other diasporic populations. Um, this plurality aims toward collective authorship while raising the visibility of Central Americans across geographies. Um, so just as some examples of work that we've done, uh, one of them was the Conexiones um, with the Family Reunion Project, which brought VR technology into um, the Central American Long Island community. And this was a way for um, families in Central America, namely El Salvador, to also connect with those who are in, um, who, those in the diaspora who've come to the New York area as a way of, um, for people to interface with one another. Um, so this was not a project that I worked on, but some of our, so we have filmmakers, we have two filmmakers, three filmmakers actually on our team, um, and we're two poets as well. Um, and then there are people who do all kinds of things in between. Um, so this is just an example of a recent thing that was done. Um, we've also held screening events. Um, we've also documented the works of artists both um, in the diaspora and in Central America. Um, and we have a whole backlog of interviews and documentation that we're processing behind the scenes always. Um, so this is just like this is just like a very quick glance of some of the earlier work that has involved more of that video documentation. Um, in the last couple of years, we've done more programming. So here's like an example of a poetry event that we did not long ago with um, Dalia Hassan, Nasia Wadud, 
um, Javier Zamora and Oscar Moises Diaz, um, who's one of our members. Um, I'm just kind of skimming through the different things that we've done. But um, I think the most, the thing that I wanted to talk most about today is our turn toward mutual aid and um, how we've decided to respond to what the pandemic has done to our communities. Um, in response to all that was going on, we decided to put together a community relief program. Um, so we wanted to do something that would both um, support our communities who've been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic in the New York area and beyond, and um, at the same time sustain our, the work of our creative community. Um, so in the last, really in the last month, we started putting together this programming um, around the idea of theater narrative community relief, um, beginning with this event on um, Central American poets, New York City based Central American writers. Um, so the idea is that in the month of May, all the events that we put on will don't will go will the proceeds will support New York um, metro area or uh, mutual aid efforts. And we very specifically wanted to support um, efforts that were not tied to NGOs that were not tied to 501 C3s. Um, because that mutual aid work is so often done very on the ground, very much in grassroots way to more immediately respond to the need. Um, so the first organization that we, or the first effort that we decided to su support was Centro Corona, um, which is based in Corona, Queens. Um, it's adjacent to El Elmhurst, which was in the news for being really hard hit um, in the New York metro area. Um, a lot of, one of our members does a lot of work with Central Corona in particular. Um, and so we decided to do this event around New York City Central American writers for two reasons. One, to support Central Corona. Two, because um, Moy and I had been talking, Moises and I had been talking a lot about um, how to bring together the Central American creative community, particularly poets, um, in a way that would make that community more visible. It's something that we had wanted to do for a long time. Um, we have longer term plans for how that might pan out, but this seemed like a good immediate way to respond to that. So we put together a reading like very quickly, really within two weeks, um, reaching out to our networks of poets that we knew. Um, we really pushed it on social media and that's how a lot of the word got out, um, mostly through Instagram, through emails also. Um, we also put it out on Twitter. So that's how we tended to get most of our audience. Um, in the end, we had about 70 RSVPs and raised over, we raised, what was it? 1,185, I believe was our final number um, in less than two weeks for Centro Corona. Um, so yeah, these are just little snippets of our readings that you can see. Um, I really regret not taking a screenshot of what was happening in that Zoom room and Jason was there, so he can attest to it. But I mean, it was really wonderful because what we did was we encouraged people who participated to like take part in the chat conversation while the reading was going on. Um, we also made sure that it was sliding scale. We don't want any of our events to be prohibitive. Um, it's really important that those who want to attend are able to attend. So we had a sliding scale of five to 20. Um, to attend the event, right? Or to, as admission for the event, but anyone could attend. Um, we're doing something similar for our next event, which is a uh, writing workshop with the poet Monica Teresa Ortiz. So this particular event will support the um, Indigenous Kinship Collective of New York City, which another one of our members is involved with. Um, so our, the, all the proceeds from this workshop will go towards supporting them and their mutual aid efforts. Um, so what Monica has done is put together these, this one day workshop that will repeat over two days. Um, and anyone who would like to take it but can't afford it is also welcome. Um, and so we have plans for that as well, but we're otherwise working on a sliding scale of $20 to $50. Um, and then we have another event planned that I won't say much about for now because the details are still coming together. Um, I will say that it's the Salvadoran artist, um, Guadalupe Maravilla, who's based in the New York area. Um, he'll be doing a sound healing workshop for us at the end of the month, and that will go towards supporting another mutual aid effort. Um, so that's just kind of an introduction of what we've been doing. Um, the collective is quite 
young, um, as in we've existed since 2016. Um, and this seemed like, you know, being able to incorporate what we do as a response to what's also been going on has just been really important and sustaining for us. Um, you know, I think maybe I'll just kind of stop there, but it really has been a lesson in just learning how um, cultural work can work towards a work as a thing to support mutual aid. I think what the question is for us now is how to keep it sustainable. Um, you know, all of us do different things and we do a number of different things and we're also dealing with the pandemic in different ways. Um, so that's like my question. One of my questions, right, is like, how do we sustain this work? Um, it's something we're kind of figuring out off the cuff. Um, you know, and I think like related to that, right, is how do we imagine how to sustain this kind of work within cap the capitalist economy that subsumes all of us and that is so damaging to us, especially now, um, how do we sustain it without reproducing some of its logics and particularly like the logics of the, um, the fundraising model, right? Like the, the NGO type model, we're really, I mean, so often these kinds of endeavors are about um, friends supporting friends, but we're also all under-resourced, right? Or like many of us are. Um, so that's something that's really been on the back of my mind. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot about it too, as someone who is affiliated with an institution, but who doesn't necessarily have a lot of power within that institution as well. So something that's really been on my mind is how to live, like, leverage those resources. Um, and I think like with any sort of collective effort, we're each always thinking about how we can bring in the resources that we have um, to support this kind of work. So I think I'll, I'll stop it for, stop talking for now, but um, yeah, that's just an introduction. I meant to show this earlier. Here's a little description of the Community Relief Fund. Um, yeah, but a lot of the work that we've done, the word has gone out through social media and it's really been the fastest most effective the way. Um, last thing I will say, what's been really beautiful about that is that we, we are very rooted in New York, the New York metropolitan area, but it's really, doing this work has really opened up um, our connections to people all over the US and also in Central America. So that's where I'll stop. Um, thank you. Awesome. awesome, thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, Christina, you ready? Hi everyone, um, my name is Christina Ree. I um, am currently living in San Diego in Kumeyaay land and uh, also very much identify with Oakland, which is where I was born and raised, Ohlone land. Um, I am an artist and I'm also currently working for the San Diego Gen Film Festival, uh, where we are very much grappling with how to continue to do what we see as very important work in the absence of movie theaters. <laughs> Um, which I think has made me really uh, kind of refocus back on how films are not commodities, but festivals really are about um, community building through the social, the social work of looking at films, um, the community building that happens with films, which I think is a good transition to talk to one of the, the projects. I'm going to be maybe touching on a few that I'm involved with, but uh, one that's called Drive-By Cinema. So let me share that screen. So this was a project um, that went on for 18 months in San Diego. Um, and twice a month, we went to 36 different neighborhoods. Um, and each one was a different vision, a different kind of drive out is what we called it. We were very much inspired by the taco shop poets who um, transformed taco shops into um, makeshift spoken word cafes and places to kind of um, be artists and be performances because uh, mainstream infrastructure wouldn't necessarily host um, taco shop poets. Um, and also the origins of theater, which are very public. They were not these black box environments where you were shushed. If you had a cell phone, you could leave, you could talk over the movie. You had a lot of kind of the noises of life going on. And so um, Drive-By Cinema was conceived as an experiment to see if we could do this and what, what it would be like. This was kind of before pop-up films were really kind of normal. Like right now, it's very normal to go to an outdoor theater. Um, and so we took over a U-Haul truck. There was a group of us. They were all artists, poets, writers, photographers, a DJ. This was funded by a very small um, experimental grant. Um, and so we just were kind of given free reign to see what would happen. Um, the image you see here was during Comic-Con where we drove through the traffic of Comic-Con. 
but could play a, a movie while driving. And so since Comic-Con is filled with traffic, what better way to see a Godzilla film, <laughs> which sort of harkens to the origins of Comic-Con being really more grassroots kind of fan based, um, you know, not as Hollywood uh, invaded event. Um, this is kind of a map of all the places we went throughout San Diego. We tried to hit neighborhoods that used to have movie theaters, but um, either through white flight or the change in dynamics of capital and geography lost movie theaters. Movie theaters used to be everywhere, um, not kind of in these downtown metropolitan areas that we see now. So one of the first places we went to was in City Heights, which is now a largely Southeast Asian and Latino neighborhood. Um, back then it used to be a very white neighborhood. And so we chose a location that had a silver screen movie theater that housed 2000 people. I don't know if you can see the terrazzo tile on the sidewalk, um, but that's kind of the movie theater it used to be. And now there's a Vietnamese tax shelter. And so we showed Kung Fu movies, everything is free. We had a, a photo booth inside the truck. We served free ramen. It was kind of a, you know, an impromptu side party. This was uh, in Chinatown, which is, um, Misael knows, there's no trace of Chinatown here at all, but it, this was the Chinatown in San Diego. So we brought one of the oldest silent movies. Uh, it was also by one of the first Asian American filmmakers, who's a woman. Uh, the movie's called Curse of Quan Guan. It was discovered in a basement. And we decided what better way to haunt old Chinatown with a film that's also um, kind of a ghost itself. We made little flip books with intertitles that showed the history of that film and also the history of that neighborhood um, to kind of bring that. So these are the, the span of the different kinds of things we would do in these 36 drive outs. We went to a neighborhood in Barrio Logan, a bakery and turned it into a sidewalk dark room where people could make photograms um, all within the space of three hours. Uh, we went to the border, we collaborated with an artist group called, Filipino American artist group called the Mail Order Brides. Um, and had what we called U-turn party. And they were in the middle of their project, which is called Manan and Google, which sort of reimagines Google as a centuries old Filipino invasive uh, monstrous empire. And so um, we went to the border to kind of um, perform this idea of labor and movement of bodies. This was during Cinco de Mayo. So there was a lot of movement of bodies. Um, and also, you know, it was, it was kind of a festive, uh, night. Um, cat videos, this is just before cat videos became super uh, mainstream, but we invited everyone to submit their favorite cat videos. Um, and they all came out in droves. If you want a crowd, show cat videos, basically, <laughs> um, with a taco stand. And so this was also in City Heights um, by a bar called the Black Cat Bar, um, appropriately. And um, we showed cat videos along with, um, I think it was like a Japanese noir film. We had kids doing their own how-to videos um, and, and that's kind of the range of the Drive by Cinema project. Um, a collaborator I work with quite a bit, her name is Rihanna Estrada in LA, this is her. Um, we have had this six year project called Everland Land. Um, it began in Hongcheon, Korea, which is a very, very small rural town um, that is a disappearing town in the sense that the, the bodies, the population keeps diminishing. It's mostly elderly and military training, which um, you know, has residences with San Diego. And so um, we decided to create what's called a Hongcheon International Fan Club. And we made buttons um, and we asked people to donate their actual fan um, during the hottest month of the summer. And then we took fan portraits and we had a big fan installation. Um, and we did a similar thing actually in LA State Historical Park for um, LA Free Waves project called Lane Eye Woman. Um, and this was actually fan club 2.0 in the sense that it was a Zana Madre International Fan Club. Um, and this is when we started to inv investigate this idea of a critical fandom. Uh, once we realized that Zana Madre was actually made with indentured unfree Indian labor. Um, and that is also kind of what was the birth of LA, the metropolis as we know it. And so as much as Ana Madre is revered as this excavated um, archeology span of time gone by, there is this lineage with LA freeway systems and the labor kind of involved in making the city we know. But we had a similar process. We, we uh, went out throughout LA and asked people to lend us a fan. Uh, we did fan portraits and created a fan club. Um, 
back to Korea, we went to the street market again in this small rural town. Um, there's an old practice uh, that's very, very old, but still kind of a superstition in Korea where if you have a lucky dream, you can actually sell your dream to your friend. It has to be for a small amount and your luck can then be transferred. So we thought how amazing this idea of an alternate economy, um, the ability to sort of you know, transfer your luck as an act of generosity and you know, solidarity with someone, um, and how anti-capitalist that it has to be a small amount, like a bag of chips or 50 cents. So we decided to take it to the market. We create our own form of money, which you see here called pink money. Um, and we actually bought in, we, saw, we tried to see if we could buy and sell dreams. And we recruited dreams from the internet. And then we also went into the market to see who would buy them and who would also sell their dreams. Um, we had contracts, we had middle school students that were helping us, um, and we had transactions. <laughs> People were excited to sell dreams and buy dreams, um, and that kind of uh, took on its life, a life of its own. Um, we then decided to take some of these dreams and pink money and quotes from these really moving dreams and do a performance in the busiest um, bus station in Seoul, which is the East Seoul bus terminal and did a slow revolution uh, in this conjoined bodysuit. And it actually um, also invites people to consider Hongcheon as a viable tourist destination um, because there is this, this ongoing tension between Seoul, which is this huge metropolis, and these smaller outskirts cities that constantly feel like they're losing their, um, their population to Seoul. Um, another part of Everland took part in San Diego where we, uh, were asked to consider the um, Balboa Park. We decided to look at Cabrillo Bridge, uh, which was once taken over by the LA Expo um, in a bid to be the, the site for the World's Fair. And they actually flooded it artificially and populated it with sea animals they knew couldn't survive. Um, sort of this idea of spectacle and um, you know movement of bodies, but also uh, kind of this, this bid for um, exoticism. Um, at the same time, um, we had just heard about Everland, which was an amusement park, a cultural park very similar to Balboa Park, where they had an elephant named Koshik who had taught himself how to speak six words in Korean um, as a sort of gesture to try to connect with his human zookeeper. Um, so we wanted to expand on this idea of um, kind of the, the body as like spectacle and then also this longing to connect uh, sorry, this is not. So we created a, a performance and a video uh, that took place in that um, location. Um, again, exploring ideas of connection. Um, and okay, so this is another collaborative uh, group I'm part of called the Super Futures Hawk Collective. Um, this is a group of three. Um, we've been around for about eight years and we really consider land. Um, we do what we call visitations, which are a form of haunting. Um, we are thinking about the practice of relationship and ceremony and sovereignty um, and native and queer world building. Um, it's a speculative and research-based group. We've done a few writings. Um, we have a place that we call the specularity, which is where ancestors meet. Um, and this is from a recent show in Seattle where we use the practice of somatics to try and connect uh, with gallery goers and um, explore this idea of exchange, gift exchange, um, yeah. healing, but then also revenge. <laughs> um, the photo that you see is a reenactment of a native uh, artist named Peggy Ball and her painting. Mm -hmm. And the, the um, fabric on the bottom are the kind of resi residue of gifts that we dropped during the ceremony you just saw. And this is a sound piece in which um, two ghosts meet. They were the two uh, supposed last members of their nation, supposedly left behind, one in Seattle, her name was Kiki Soblu, and one is uh, Fanny Ball, who was a Modoc woman in, um, in Portland, Oregon. And they meet and they exchange gifts in the specularity. Um, let's see. And this is a, another um, video ceremony that we did um, in a hot springs that is on a 
very old vintage TV with a very old vintage iPad taped to it. Um, and at this point, we are actually um, working on some projects that have to do with beavers, um, as well as we've been thinking a lot about how there has been this mass death toll from COVID and very little public process of mourning um, or very public process or ceremony for this huge, um, huge loss. And um, so these are the, the things that Superfutures Hong Collective right now are considering. Oops. Thank you, Christina. Um, Sal, ready? Yep, let me pull up the screen here. Cool. Well, hi everyone again. Uh, my name is Misael Diaz. I'm an artist and educator that's based in uh, Southern California and uh, Northern Baja California. Um, I am also an assistant professor uh, at Cal State San Marcos, in the Department of Art, Media and Design. Um, and yeah, thank you all for sharing your work. It's been so rad to to see what you're all working on and and how inspiring that work is. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about my work as part of Cogni Collective, uh, which is a binational arts collective that I co-founded along with Amy Sanchez Artiaga in 2010. Uh, we've been based uh, since then uh, in Tijuana, San Diego, uh, largely now expanding up into the LA region. Uh, right now I'm broadcasting uh, from National City in Kumeya Island. Uh, we recently uh, relocated back to San Diego after spending some time away in Orange County, uh, doing an extended residency at uh, Grand Central Arts Center uh, in Santana. Um, so we're happy to be back and excited to continue some of the early work that we began uh, in 2010, um, especially uh, and specifically uh, at the San Isidro Port of Entry, which uh, you see an aerial, aerial view of here. Um, so you see the US-Mexico borderline uh, and the port of entry is a site where cars line up uh, to cross from Tijuana into San Diego. This is a site that I spent a lot of time in as a kid. Uh, for a while, my family and I were living in Tijuana and I was crossing the border every day to go to school in San Diego. Um, and it's a site that uh, I was interested in returning to, that Amy, uh, my collaborator, was also interested in returning to uh, because I think it really represented for us this opportunity to think about uh, the border not as an abstraction, but as something that's concrete and on the ground. Uh, much of the work that we've been developing uh, is taking inspiration um, from the kind of critical pedagogy of, of Paulo Freire uh, and thinking about the notion of praxis and thinking about uh, processes of reflection that lead to action and actions that lead to reflection. Uh, so we became really interested in, in trying to think about how it is that the border exists at once as this kind of like overarching counter or like this overarching meta narrative. Uh, but also as this kind of very specific reality on the ground uh, and how those two kind of understandings of the border are often disconnected uh, and can lead to violence to the communities that are kind of most impacted uh, that are residing and crossing the border on a daily basis. Uh, so we became interested in returning to this site in 2010 uh, and specifically uh, in working uh, from within this market that's located at the crossing, um, developing a series of projects uh, that sought to learn what it was to kind of go to the border, not to cross or not to leave, but to actually kind of be there. Uh, so to take a cue from the kinds of uh, economic realities of a lot of these vendors who are third generation, uh, some of them who have kind of been selling, uh, whose families have been selling at the border for years now and decades. Um, and we arrived at this moment where there was an interest in trying to reimagine re this space, um, shifted away from the types of kind of goods that they were selling uh, because they weren't uh, being uh, profitable. Much of the market was empty. So there was this kind of opportunity to try to work with them to uh, rethink how it is that this market could function. Uh, part of the work that we began doing and, and I think which became the way uh, or kind of served to establish a model for how it is that we worked uh, and have been working since then is to undertake research around some of the modalities, uh, the kind of day-to-day -day economic practices of uh, communities. Uh, so we became really interested in the types of uh, kind of informal uh, networks uh, that vendors were already uh, developing uh, to try to make ends meet, uh, to try to kind of 
um, circumvent some of the macroeconomic limitations that were being placed upon them um, by things like the free trade agreements, uh, by NAFTA, uh, and by types of governmental limitations uh, that, that prevented movement across the border. Um, so how it is that they were kind of appointing certain ones of them to cross the border, border to purchase goods in San Diego to then cross back into Tijuana to resell at the border as these kind of like souvenir goods from, of Mexico, of Tijuana, like this uh, Chinese made uh, colorful zebra print blanket. Um, so we became interested in kind of tracing this, uh, the ways that uh, vendors were already again, kind of figuring out ways of working um, through loopholes, uh, getting away um, from the kind of constraints that were being put upon them, not just by one state, but by two states uh, in this kind of very, um, yeah, like um, oppressive uh, structure that is the border. Um, and also at the same time, I think uh, importantly it became um, interesting for us to think about the fact that many of them expressed a desire to return to selling kind of more artisanal goods um, that were kind of more handmade that weren't produced in China and passed off as kind of like these Mexican products, um, but that were actually, um, yeah, like produced and had something to do with the kinds of uh, communities and, and cultures of, of Mexico. Um, one of the groups that was uh, maintained at the kind of margins and periphery of this market um, when we arrived uh, was this group of indigenous uh, women from the interior of Mexico, uh, Mixtec uh, women, uh, who had started their own collective uh, to embroider blouses and to embroider other goods um, using kind of these uh, skills that they had acquired, um, some at home, some uh, in Tijuana after migrating to the border. Um, and again, one of the interesting opportunities for us became trying to facilitate connection between vendors that wanted to produce and sell uh, more, you know, I, I, I struggle with the word authentic, but I guess more like artisanal, more handmade uh, goods. Um, and the fact that there was this group um, who was in a sense being um, rendered invisible uh, and being forced to produce uh, and work uh, very informally, uh, that was already there. Um, so we kind of siphoned off some funds uh, from uh, the university that I was attending as part of a graduate degree in visual arts um, to start this residency uh, within the market um, to offer space uh, for this uh, group of Mishtek women uh, to produce uh, their blouses, uh, to finish their blouses. The kind of act of finishing the blouse within this uh, space uh, permitted their product and allowed them to then sell it at the crossing um, legally. Uh, so it kind of became a way of, of um, leveraging the permitting structure of this market. Um, and at the same time, I think became an opportunity to bring together uh, this group of vendors uh, who had been uh, somewhat, I think, hostile even uh, to this group of women uh, because of things like gender discrimination, ethnic discrimination, um, and just kind of cultural misunderstandings. Uh, so to try to kind of facilitate uh, this process of connection and engagement, we started developing and hosting uh, language exchange workshops, uh, thinking about sharing uh, ways of, um, yeah, like learning and speaking Spanish, uh, Mixtec and English. Um, and these became kind of these dialogue circles uh, that we hosted uh, with the group of Mixtec women, uh, with groups of vendors, and then just kind of groups of uh, interesting uh, other artists and, and, and thinkers uh, from the region. Um, and we also collaborated with the, with the group uh, to produce this large scale hand embroidered mural um, that has a phrase uh, that is common in both Mixtec and Spanish which translates to something like, uh, it is better to light a fire than to curse the darkness. Um, and so for us, I think this project uh, kind of served as a foundation uh, for rethinking how it is that uh, market spaces could function beyond the kind of purely economic uh, rationale, while at the same time acknowledging that uh, for so many um, families and, and communities, there's this very pressing reality of the economics of, of livelihood um, and of needing to kind of like develop a sustainable way of, of existing in the world, uh, economically speaking. Uh, so I think that this uh, became an interest of ours that we're now developing um, as part of this kind of mobile platform that we call the Mobile Institute for Citizenship and Art, uh, which is a fiberglass trailer 
uh, that we've uh, retrofitted and outfitted to function um, as a kind of platform for um, different sorts of workshops. Uh, it also functions as a pirate radio station um, that we've been establishing uh, within uh, different market, uh, public markets uh, in Southern California. These are uh, installation shots of the um, installation uh, that we had um, and the kind of like micro res residency that we had at the Santa Fe Springs swap meet, uh, where we were able to work um, with groups like Manos Unidas Creando Arte, um, who are a group of women uh, from Santana who are kind of coming together to uh, develop a cooperative models uh, for artisan making uh, using recycled goods. Uh, this is a group that we've been working on and off of now for a few years. Um, and the kind of model of working with different community organizations is one that, that uh, we continue to employ, uh, working with both kind of artisans uh, to develop economic platforms, but also with groups like Resilience Orange County, uh, who uh, does uh, deportation defense and immigration rights work in, in Orange County. Uh, we worked with them to host a protest uh, kind of banner making workshop uh, where we took inspiration from the aesthetics of the markets uh, to devise a kind of alternative um, kind of uh, protest sign. Um, and in collaboration, we ended up deciding on, on doing protest balloons. Uh, so we invited uh, local youth uh, to kind of uh, activate the space that we had established uh, within the markets to create these uh, banners. Uh, and then we undertook a march throughout the market. Um, so this is something that we've, um, yeah, been interesting in, in continuing um, and setting up. We've also done uh, iterations of this uh, in Tijuana, uh, in street markets in Tijuana. And um, I think just, um, yeah, as one final uh, shout out uh, to Christina's, we, we actually recently were able to also do a kind of like a drive-by theater inspired uh, project at the port of entry at the crossing. Uh, where we worked with vendors to actually transform one of the banners on top of the market into this um, into a screen. Uh, so this is another example, I guess, of the ways that we've already kind of been looking and thinking about how it is that models that we see other people employing can be utilized within the specific contexts uh, that I think each one of us are working in. So I just wanted to end here because I, I, I appreciated the work that, that you all did. Uh, Christina and um, yeah and and to also a nod to Jason to how I think that such conversations are interesting because they do introduce us to these kinds of different ways of operating and these different like methods uh, that could be applicable uh, within our own context so yeah great uh, thank you Ms. Mm -hmm. so, uh Maya had to, to step out to another meeting but I want to maybe uh, begin a conversation Hopefully, we'll be able to continue in some format um, as we kind of move in in uh, um, thinking about other iterations of how this conversation might go. But just to kind of begin, um, one of the kind of consistent threads that I saw, and all of you are kind of working, again, in very um, site-specific contexts with different kinds of media, right, different forms of art, different practices, different methods, right? Uh, but there's, there's certainly at least, there are many threads that I think uh, um, uh, kind of come out in your work from today's these this kind of the, what you just presented uh, more threads than I had, uh, had thought initially right and so even uh, with with Maya's work and kind of thinking about collaboration in terms of kind of going from this kind of hashtag or this idea of new global matriarchy to kind of linking up with the collaborator and that cultivating more space right that cultivating other forms of kinship and collaboration, right? Uh, uh, directly working, you three working directly with collectives, right? Um, and with varying sizes, right, of the collectives, uh, varying kind of disciplines and things like that. I wanna maybe ask you to maybe reflect on a little bit uh, more of kind of uh, what it's like to work in that kind of collaborative spirit, right, in that with that kind of like how that works. I know that Miriam, you said that uh, TN or uh, TN narrative uh, operates off of this kind of non-hierarchical kind of model, which I, I, I'm assuming also that uh, um, uh, Christina, Christina, your work operates in that way. Ms. Al, your work operates in that way as well. Maybe just kind of 
uh, wanting to tease out a little bit what some of the realities, maybe some of the challenges or some of the, the stuff that's most generative in kind of your experience in working in the, the context of uh, collaboration and, and the context of a collective, right? And why that, maybe why that's imp so important to your practice, right, as an individual, as an artist. I mean, I can um, say quite honestly that collaboration, uh, collaboration saves lives. <laughs> and what I mean is that um, there is a way that collaboration is very feeding, you know, feeds the soul. Um, I think people have very different relationships to art making, but um, for me, it is, it is very important to do it with and alongside people. And um, had it not been for collaborations, I don't know if I would have survived as an artist, quite honestly. Um, there's an accountability that is really productive, um, especially because it's with people you trust. Um, and even when there are conflicts, there is um, always, I think, under, undergirding our collaboratives, um, love. And so without that love, these conflicts can be um, the death the death bell, you know. Um, so there is a way that you know we are greater because of our collaborations. Um, the sum is much greater than our parts, and so there is very much of you push the ball a little bit, and the next person takes it and pushes it even further, and so on and so forth. Um, Super Futures Hawk Collective. We don't even live in the same city. Um, Angie Morrill, she's a native scholar in Portland. Um, Sam Jung is an environmental policymaker in New York, you know, and um, we exist virtually, really. Um, and so there are challenges with that, but it is, I think it is really the only way that I seem to be able to, to work. I mean, I think, yeah, everything that Christina has said is really beautiful, and I think also very true of that, that there is something super sustaining about working together and um, like sustaining for the soul, right? Like everybody's always so excited to talk about what we want to do next and um, who we want to reach out to and bring into the fold in some way and who we want to support. So I think especially now um, with everything that's been going on, actually Tierra Narratives activity has been really bustling. Um, I think because we all really desire that connection right now and really need it. Um, so yeah, it's just been, those conversations have been something that I've been looking forward to regularly. Um, I mean, like just kind of on a, like a day-to-day -day level, a lot of that conversation happens. Um, and, and Jason, you brought up the non-hierarchical aspect, right? A lot, a lot of the conversations weirdly are happening um, through messaging just throughout the day um, as we're all doing different things. It's sort of like, it's the iMessage window becomes the place where all the conversations happen. And for a while it was Instagram, weirdly. Um, <laughs> um, my my collaborative, collaborative members are, are a little younger than I am and maybe they're more prone to having conversations there, <laughs> but it's recently migrated to um, iMessage. Um, so that's really been the place where just throughout the day, if something comes to mind or if there's something that we want to share um, as a kind of like, way to move towards the next idea right like right now we're thinking a lot about what june might look like um you know at what pace do we want to go who do we want to invite to do some sort of digital event um yeah it's sort of where the ideas get bounced around but we do have these meetings where we solidify what the you know the practical logistics and um we tease out the details um the other thing i'll say is that you know, we all have very different skills, and I think that's part of what has really um, helped with the very collaborative, I mean, the collaborative nature of the collaborative, right? Like, everybody has a different skill to offer. Um, I mentioned that we have three filmmakers. Everybody has very different technical skills among them. Um, I have a lot of administrative experience, which has been really handy, I think, with just, like, things like getting out the word, um, you know? Um, and then we also have members who, are, who have curatorial experience too. So all these things, I think, right, like these different skill sets have been really important um, in making things happen. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll only add that um, part of it, um, which has been uh, 
definitely an aspect, a nice aspect about working uh, as part of a collaborative is, is that also just sometimes uh, it's difficult <laughs> to be working in community with very limited resources, trying to tackle issues that are difficult. I think uh, I spoke about the work that we've done at the Port of Entry, but there's a, another series of projects that we've done uh, working in uh, migrant shelters along the border. And like that's just like emotionally draining work. Um, and again, when you're trying to, um, yeah, be in solidarity with, with folks that are in very difficult situations, um, it just gets hard. And I think trying to come up with creative solutions um, by yourself, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> that, that would, that would, that I just, yeah, it, that's scary to even think about. Uh, so it's nice to just have, I guess, even if it's one more person that is going through that same experience. And I think that allows for that process of reflection uh, around the types of, yeah, like uh, ways of, of moving forward and what that can, in, that could entail. Um, in addition to then just the practical, um, yeah, like different skills that, that each one of us brings to the table, um, to echo Miriam's point. But yeah, I think I, I can't envision kind of doing this work alone, uh, which I, I know that there's folks that do and I'm always just impressed <laughs> because yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I, I have the fortitude <laughs> to do that. Just to add, I wanna add to that, um, you know, we were so excited in Tierra Narrative to just find each other. Um, like I had never, I mean, especially being on the East Coast, I had never had a Central American community um, really being here, not like what I grew up with in Houston. Um, and so I think like a lot of that just excitement of having found each other and wanting to like make sense of what finding each other meant, that excitement has been so important and it's really what gets us going. It's like, oh, there's so much that we can, do together and that we can ask together. Um, that's been really important. Yeah, I would, I would like to add, um, echo everything everyone said, but there's definitely a way that the excitement you're mentioning um, is, is markedly different. When I do solo work, it's very unexciting, it's very serious, you know, <laughs> the pressure and the weight is, is like, for some reason, much more grave. Um, and in collaboration, there is a much more openness, kind of a sense of uh, fun and sharing um, and feeling that I think it invites. Um, and I do feel like, you know, as, as artists of color, we are in a precarious position. And so there's a way that collaborations offer strength in numbers. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me that so many collaborations are artists of color, are women um, kind of responding to this landscape of, you know, a very white male dominated um, art world. Right. I think, you know, I think that it, what, it seems like, you know, the, the, the spirit of collaboration in terms of not just not in terms of necessarily just shouldering labor, but like, again, like that, that kind of uh, Miriam and, and Missy are talking about and, and, and uh, Christina kind of this, this, um, this foundation of love, right, this foundation of kind of love for one another and uh, being able to show up for each other and being able to see each other, right, and being able to, to um, kind of work with a with at least a very basic fundamental understanding that you're there for each other right and so what that it, it seems like in all of the different projects that you presented um what that enables is a different kind of artistic imaginary right and so the 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 point of solidarity or the point of collaboration might be begin with you and a member of your collective or or, or maya maya's case her and a friend right but that uh, generates a spirit of wanting to be in community or solidarity with folks outside of that context as well, right? And so uh, in, in all of your works, the trajectory kind of, it, at, at least the way that I'm reading it, kind of goes from this kind of very um, uh, intimate space of, of collective work, right? That this collective praxis, right? Of like intimacy, right? And that becomes so generative that it becomes something to cultivate and, and want to share, just humbly share with a wider community, right? Which is where I think, I think at least that's my reading where, you know, the notion of an alternative economy, right? The notion of uh, an alternative flow of resources, leveraging dominant, powerful institutions uh, to kind of see the work that we're doing, right? Both in, in, in these kind of, in ways that, that are 
uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, misayel, that are legitimate, right? That don't uh, get those communities in trouble, right? But in ways that help us build more space and capacity for this kind of work, you know what I'm saying? So maybe, you, like, I, I don't know if, if, if that is, you know, the, the, the notion of alternative economies, alternative resource flow. I think that's the term, uh, alternative economy is the term that you use, Christina. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, kind of where you're, in this particular moment, I think we see it very materially in mutual aid, right? The framework of mutual aid and how you're talking about it, Mario. But uh, just kind of where might some of your thinking be in terms of, of alternative economies, right? As as kind of the work that we do in 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 the one on the one hand, it's transformed by the, this particular historical situation, right? But on the other hand, it's also work that you've already been doing, right? Which is why I, I kind of thought it would be a great conversation to have amongst. Uh, um, you all, right? So we're, I, I guess, to, to, <laughs> I have a, a bad habit of not asking a question when I'm asking a question. Um, where does the, the, the notion of alternative economy or, or research flow kind of figure into your, your current thinking, not necessarily in projects, but kind of maybe some of the things you've been thinking about uh, given the moment that we're in? I mean, I'll, I'll just start and say that, you know, the fun part about art making is, is the world making, is that you get to get away with inventing new rules, even for a short amount of time and inventing new hustles, right? Or like siphoning money off from one grant to create a whole new reality that we didn't think could happen, right? And so what I, what I love about art is that it, it expands what we imagine is possible, right? And so our imaginations can be larger than just a critique. Um, and so that speculative potential for art making is what I think of as an alternative economy, um, especially um, during times when we're so, so viscerally aware of what's wrong. Um, I feel like art making can offer other futures um, and really, you know, like immersive ideas of what that could look like. And so whether it's, um, you know, rerouting funds so that um, craftswomen can make what they want to make um, or, you know, creating new forms of money for lucky dreams. Um, I do feel like at least the projects I've been involved with, our interest is in these popular forms, um, whether it's superstitions or haggling or parking lots or the sidewalk, you know. Um, and I think that is probably in response to this idea of where are the, where can we make worlds, you know, where are the alternative foundations for our world making? Um, and so as we think about, you know, with Super Futures Hong Collective, we're thinking a lot about beavers and how a lot of um, imaginations were put on the beavers to save the world. Um, and then they were, ex you know, almost ex made extinct and now they, they have never gone away. Um, and it seems very relevant now with environmental crises. Um, and then also inventing new ceremonies of mourning, of mourning for all the dead. And so I think these are, they're not alternative economies in terms of capitalism per se, but they are alternative practices that we can um, have a hand in shaping. Yeah, and I think for us, um, the notion of alternative economy is ultimately, I think, um, most palpable um, when the platform for exchange where the economy is taking place is one that is, um, I guess, more inclusive of people's humanity. <laughs> uh, or like, and it's not just purely, I think, understanding economic exchange um, as, you know, like, or it's, it's, I guess, trying to envision a type of economic exchange that can be not just um, one that is an exchange of objects between objects, right? Or like people who are objectified selling commodities as objects. Uh, I think one of the things that we, or one of the ways in which we experience that uh, very um, poignantly at the crossing is that when you cross and you're little, you're told to never look at the vendors, to like never make eye contact, because if you do, then they're gonna immediately try to sell you the thing that they're trying to sell. And because you're stuck in traffic, they're gonna, they're gonna maybe succeed <laughs> because they have like hours of, to try to like pressure you into buying this thing. So you kind of like go into the space 
um, with blinders on, you know, and you don't acknowledge anyone's humanity, <laughs> like, or you don't acknowledge their presence, right? So I think for us, uh, it was interesting to try to change that sort of dynamic of the space. Uh, I think we uh, tried to do that both within the market and through projects, um, other projects that involved like Pirate Radio um, that documented some of the oral histories of the vendors, for example, um, for people who were waiting in line to be able to actually tune their radio uh, and to listen to the story of some of a person who's trying to sell them this thing, right? So it, it, it shifts the understanding of that person as just like a, a, a blank body, uh, you know, trying to sell you a product into, um, yeah, like something that allows you to maybe acknowledge or at least recognize that person as human. Maybe you're not going to buy their thing, but it's not, um, yeah, it's, it's not dehumanizing in the same way that a lot of these market spaces can, can ultimately like become. Um, and I think that they're also just already that, uh, and that's, I think, what we already gravitate towards is that many of these public market spaces are already spaces that are functioning beyond a kind of purely economic rationale uh, that already have a kind of like really important social function, a really important cultural function. So I think for us, it's trying to highlight that and amplify that as, as something that is, I guess, a necessary component of, of any sort of like imagining of an alternative economy. This question, I don't know why it feels so hard for me, even though in some ways it feels very obvious. I mean, I think, um, I mean, mutual aid by nature does provide some kind of alternative way of bringing resources to a community that needs it. Um, but at the same time, it's like, the, I mean, and this kind of ties into the question that I had that like, you know, how do we build these systems of support when we're so like imbricated within what capitalism is doing all the time. Um, I mean, I kind of think of it, and I won't say I'm speaking on behalf of the collective, this is just coming from me. I, I would say that like, I mean, I think of it less as an alternative economy as like just working within the structure with the resources that we have um, and like figuring out ways that we can bring together community. Again, because Central American community has been so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? dissipated across the New York metropolitan area in some ways that it, it feels really important to figure out how to bring that community together so that we can start to figure out how to support um, all these different intersecting communities that are Central American and also other things, right? Like, um, yeah, just bringing that kind of into a concentration so that we can start extending resources. Um, you know, both to the people who come to us, whether that be through like cultural resources or whether that be in asking in exchange um, for funds that we can provide to others. So yeah, I mean, the, the question of alternative, that's all to say the question is really important to me and something I've been thinking about a lot about. Um, and mutual aid is also something that I just feel like I'm still learning a lot about. Um, and I think we all are, um, but yeah. Maybe I'll just stop there. It's on my mind. Well, I know we are way over time, <laughs> um, but I, I want to maybe put out some, some threads that we might pursue um, for a future conversation and, and maybe round out this particular discussion um, just as, uh, um, uh, as, it, it'll, uh, as it'll be posted in the near future. Um, but uh, one of the things that I that I want to uh, maybe kind of invite you all uh, and and a few other folks and 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 whoever you might also think of as you know um, is is to kind of continue this conversation um, and to develop working templates right and and working models for folks. I think that you know one of the reasons I uh, reached out to ASA for this particular freedom course uh, was uh, one to, just to kind of highlight some of this dynamic work that is kind of in my immediate kind of circle, right? Folks that I, I'm kind of in conversation with uh, um, uh, fairly often as of late um, and, and to provide potential models uh, as, a, as a teacher, potential models for students to think about um, what some of these models of collaboration uh, and art making and, and creative practice might look like, right? And, and kind of what work is out there, right? As we all know, we're, we're all coming from various genealogies and we know that this work is not new. 
right? Uh, but I wanted to, uh, you know, bring us all in the same room and, and, and kind of uh, think about these things together to provide templates that could be revised and repurposed and reused for other folks. So almost like thinking about a guidebook for um, different kinds of collective making, world building, right? Art pro thinking through projects and things like that, right? And so that uh, I, I'm interested in, in uh, extending that invitation to other folks that you know, other collaborators that you know and that, that uh, and you trust, right? Um, as a way of uh, maybe uh, rounding out uh, today's conversation, I want to thank all of you and, and also Maya uh, for sharing your work and, and, and spending some time uh, just kind of opening up this conversation. Uh, um, and I want to thank uh, 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 the, the uh, President-elect of American Studies Association, Dylan Rodriguez, who gave us the green light to, to, um, uh, to kind of have this conversation and, and have it hosted with uh, ASA as a freedom course. Um, and I think, I, I'm hoping, I know that I'm probably going to use it in my class uh, in the fall, right? Uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that labor. Um, and, and so I, I'll, I'll round it out. Um, with kind of where I'm at, uh, uh, I guess, affectively or feelings wise, and kind of hearing you talk about, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, what I what I hear is a, a is a, a, a really profound commitment um, to uh, your people, right? Your the, the people you love and, and your collectives, but also the, co the the communities that the collective serves, right? And so I'm going to read uh, and run this out in a perfect kind of circle uh, with another poem from uh, a comrade is as precious as a seedling uh, by uh, Mila Aguilar. And this poem is called Comrade. Uh, and I did not plan this. I just, this is the feeling that I'm at. I so I was drawn to, to reading it um, as a kind of maybe a gesture of, of hopefully sustaining these kind of intimate, intimate collaborations, right? So Comrade uh, by Mila Aguilar. This morning, comrade, after drowning out the depths of my sadness in a solitary bathroom, I was surprised to find that Kaliza had ironed the pants and shirt I had laid out for our meeting. Had she seen the silence in my eyes upon waking, I wondered, so much concern to compensate for someone else's self-indulgence. <laughs> right, so he's kind of smaller gestures of, of intimacy and solidarity, I think, uh, um, are just kind of where I'm at uh, in my head and in my feelings right now. So, but I want to thank you again, Misael, Christina, Miriam, and also Maya. Um, and, and again, thanks uh, to ASA and the Freedom Courses Initiative. Thank you. Thank you.